Well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, before we even start, I wanted to give big thanks to Ellen for helping to organize this event. Um, and it is a real pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker today, Jason De Leon, who is professor of anthropology and uh, Chicana Chicano studies and director of the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology at UCLA. But he's so much more than this title suggests. An archaeologist who wrote his dissertation on Olmec Obsidian, a musician who moved from hardcore punk reggae onto Americana and now plays bass in the biggest little rock band in Laurel Canyon, <laughs> the War Pigs. Check them out. They, I heard they will be touring and coming to Passing Through Providence this summer. A photographer, film producer, LA Lakers fan, recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, and a friend. In 2009, Jason founded the Undocumented Migration Project and started a long-term study of clandestine migration between Latin America and the United States using ethnographic, visual, archaeological, and forensic methods. Today, UMP is a research arts education collective that both raises awareness about migration issues globally while also helping to reunite families with the loved ones who have gone missing crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. His first book, The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant Trail, which was published by University of California Press in 2015, offered an incisive, eloquent critique of the Border Patrol's security strategy known as prevention through deterrence, which turns 20 this year. This book won numerous awards, including the Margaret Mead Award from the Society for Applied Anthropology, and Staley Book Prize from the School for Advanced Research. It has since become a new classic in anthropology, one of the most taught books in the last decade. Following the publication of the book, Jason co-curated a touring museum exhibit, State of Exception, which displayed backpacks and shoes and water bottles and other items left behind by border crossers in order to draw broader public attention to the human consequences of US immigration policy. In 2019, he started curating a participatory art project called Hostile Terrain 94, which involves filling out over 4,000 toe tags that represent migrants who died while crossing the Sonoran Desert in Arizona and hanging them on a map. This installation has already been shown in over 100 locations nationally and globally. Today, Jason is here to talk about his new book, Uh, Soldiers and Kings, Survival and Hope in the World of Human Smuggling, which was published just last month in March by Viking. It is an ethnography of the lives of Honduran men and some women who have become smugglers, making a living from guiding undocumented migrants through Mexico. Pulitzer Prize winning sociologist and fellow ethnographer Matt Desmond calls Soldiers and Kings a work of extraordinary reportage and compassion. It will shock you, move you, and leave you changed. Having read the book twice now, I assure you that he is right. So this is what will happen next. We'll hear from Jason who will read some excerpts, excerpts from his book. Then my colleagues, professors Yanis Hamilakis and Peter Andreas and me will engage Jason in a conversation and then we'll open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. There will be books and book signing and the reception at the end. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jason De Leon. Thank you so much for that very kind uh, introduction. It's really wonderful to be here. It's also just really wonderful to be here on this panel with three people whose work ha have, has long inspired me in, in different ways and who I've really um, enjoyed being in, in conversation with, either in person or virtually or in, in print. And so it's just really nice to, um, 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 uh, to be here with, um, with, with, with uh, my fellow panelists. Um, what I'm going to do, I guess, is I'll read just a little bit from the book. Um, I want to just give a couple of quick kind of things first. Um, a little, just a quick little bit of background. Um, so the book is a, a trade book. Um, 
that's been been published by by Viking Press, and it focuses really on the lives of about six um, six individuals that I met who were sort of intertwined uh, with the the world of clandestine migration and people who were directly involved in uh, in in human smuggling. The project began in 2015, right um, during a moment where border enforcement was dramatically changing in Mexico, where um, we were in the kind of wake of the summer of 2014, when thousands of unaccompanied minors from largely from Honduras were showing up at the U.S.-Mexico border, um, raising a, um, a awareness about the issues that were happening in that country um, for a brief moment, and then suddenly those folks disappeared. And uh, you know, President Obama came out at one point um, later that year and said, "We've problem is solved. These kids are not coming back anymore. We've secured the border." Uh, we hadn't really done anything at the U.S.-Mexico border. What had happened is that um, in 2015, um, end of 2014, summer of 2014, and, um, and into 2015, Mexico launched a program called Plan Frontera Sur, which was basically. Um, their version of the U.S. policy of prevention through deterrence, which is trying to prevent migrants from Central America and beyond from getting across the length of Mexico. This policy goes into place with um, an intense amount of financial support and political pressure from the United States to basically stop Central Americans before they get to the U.S. doorstep. Um, what this does is it leads to a rise in deportations of Central Americans and other migrants, um, uh, checkpoints, detention centers, um, as well as a steep rise in corruption amongst um, law enforcement agencies who were, who were charged with supposedly protecting migrants, but then who become deeply involved in, um, in their exploitation. Simultaneously, uh, drug cartels and transnational organizations like MS-13 become even more interested in, uh, in, in taxing the movement of migrants across Mexico. Um, MS-13 starts to control the, the migrant routes and who gets to move people from one place to another, and transnational uh, and Mexican drug cartels at different key geographic uh, points uh, across the country then start charging head taxes for um, um, for people coming through. And so it creates this, Plan from Teta Sur creates this, this new kind of difficult labyrinth that people need to get through, um, and one that becomes m uh, much more violent and more expensive and um, really drives the need for um, for more human smugglers, and so the the project kind of begins as this as this whole thing is is happening, um, and as long as, as stuff is ramping up and, and smuggling is starting to change and become a lot more violent than it had been um, uh, previously, and you know the book, uh, the the question has often been posed to me is why why smugglers, and I think on a most on the most basic level. Smugglers are a crucial part of this global billion dollar industry of, of clandestine migration and yet probably the most poorly understood element of it. And so I wanted to try to understand this aspect of, of the process that, um, that little attention had been, um, had been paid, uh, paid to. Um, and so the book really, it's, it's about the world of smuggling. It's about the labor that smugglers um, um, carry out. Um, it's about uh, the services that they provide. Um, but it's also, I hope, helping the reader to think about smuggling not as the problem to be solved, but as a symptom of border enforcement, as a symptom of capitalism, as a symptom of, um, uh, of climate change, um, and also something deeply connected to issues of poverty, race, and class. Um, and so that's all kind of inter, inter, interwoven into the, into the book, which really revolves around um, six sort of main people who I write about and whose stories are, um, some of them are directly connected to one another, some of them are, are running kind of kind of parallel. And the book sort of moves in and out between all of those folks, giving you kind of what's happening to them currently, as well as lots of information um, and, and background about how mm -hmm. they ended up in the world of smuggling, as well as their attempts to get out of it. So all that being said, I thought I would just maybe give us, you know, three or four kind of short little moments um, from the book and then and then op open up a, a conversation. Um, so one of the, I was pretty excited to publish this book with Viking, um, primarily because John Steinbeck had published all his books with Viking and it was like being on the same label as John, John Steinbeck. And I asked the press when I was gonna get to meet him and they said probably, that hopefully not anytime soon. <laughs> um, um, uh, so, you know, but you know, 
Steinbeck has always been a, an, an important writer for me, um, both, I think, thematically and just even um, stylistically. And so there's a, ch a chapter in the book where I introduce a, a, little, a little tiny village called Pacalna in the, the southern Mexican state of Chiapas. And the beginning of Cannery Row, it starts off, you know, Cannery Row in Monterey in California is a poem, is a blah, 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 blah. And so I stole part of that line for this introduction to the village of, of, of Pacalna, which in some ways really the, 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 the characters that, that I came to know there and the, the way that the stories are sort of intertwined, in some ways actually felt like I was living in, in, in Cannery Row, except instead of being near the water, we were on the, uh, on the train tracks in the jungle. So here's that introduction. Pacalna in Chiapas in Mexico is a poem, a bloodletting, a roadside memorial, a wish. Laughter echoing from inside a dark place. Blinding heat. Clothes wet with jungle. Railroad ties shiny and smooth from a million frantic footsteps. It's the sun reflected off sharpened metal. A rooster screaming. A man screaming. Hope and hopelessness. Desire and greed. Pacalna in Chiapas in Mexico is the center of migrant worlds that disappear only to remake themselves in new outlines and shadows. And Pacalna is this tiny little village. It's on the, it's on the outskirts of the town of, uh, called Palenque, which is known for the archaeological site of the same name in southern Mexico. Um, Palenque is a big tourist attraction, tourist trap. Pacalna is, uh, is quite the opposite, um, but literally the other side of the, of, of, of the train tracks. And Pacalna is where I began a lot of this work. It's where I met um, this crew of, of, of smugglers and, and individuals who I ended up spending quite a bit of time with on the train tracks um, at the beginning of this route from southern Mexico up to the U.S.-Mexico border. And so here's a, a moment with a bunch of, of, of people who I will later then um, write more about in the book. Look, kid, you're Mexican, Papo says. You're from here, and we're not. When you're older, you'll have the privilege of leaving Pacalna and crossing up to the border without worrying about getting deported before you even get there. So, for now, fuck off. The boy, who is barely six or seven, stands firm. He doesn't want to leave. Get the fuck out of here, Papo yells. The kid is a statue, naked except for threadbare dress pants whose frayed cuffs barely reach his ankles. He's a miniature Robinson Crusoe shipwrecked on these train tracks. He is poor even by migrant standards. He is immovable. Papo's jaw tenses and his scrawny, tattooed arms flex in anger. He pushes the boy to the ground and I flinch. The boy's four-year-old brother looks at Papo with great concern. We told you to get the fuck out of here, someone says. Just go, Santos implores them. The boy stands back up and is now crying, but he holds firm. His little brother tugs at his arm. These fucking children have no fear, Chino jokes. I try to intervene. Mira, Papi, it's only because we're talking about adult stuff around here. It's better that kids aren't around. He gives me a blank look. Tears begin to fall. I awkwardly put my arm around his shoulder. He keeps crying. And he starts to hyperventilate. Alma just shakes her head. Just give him five pesos so he will leave. She is cradling her own four-year-old daughter, Dulce, and tries to shoo the boy away. Vaya, vaya. I put a thick Mexican coin into the kid's dirty hand. Papo takes a few aggressive steps toward the children. The boys turn and start heading south down the tracks. In unison, they step over scattered piles of garbage that decorate the ground, as if following some unspoken choreography. The older boy puts his arm around his little brother as they disappear into the distance. How many years will pass before they turn around and start heading in the other direction, like so many children before them? Yason, don't worry about it. Let him go. Alma tells me as she puts her bleached blonde hair into a tight ponytail. These kids in Pakalna are too much. They're always here. They're always stealing food from us. 
Every time we are drinking and smoking, that older kid is here. He even drinks Kanye, cane liquor. That's why I keep my daughter close and don't, don't let her play with him. That fucking kid stole a bottle of tequila from us the other night, Papo yells. Oye, you better be nice to those children, Chino jokingly admonishes us. Because in a few years, they'll be the new ones robbing us on the train tracks. We all laugh, knowing full well that it's true. And so all of those folks, Papo, Chino, Santos, Alma, are, are folks whose stories I end up, I end up following um, for many, many years as they try to come in and out of, um, of the world of smuggling and, and get off the, the, the train tracks. Um, I'm going to read you, this is a scene here with me and Chino on the tracks where he's just kind of up to his, his normal antics. Um, and... Yeah, let's, 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 we'll just do that. <clears throat> the lead engine lurches 50 feet forward. It stops and then reverses, slamming hard into the car behind it. Grinding metal and screeching engine brakes compete with roosters and tropical birds. So we're still in, we're still in Pakalna. The train heaves forward once again, reverses and slams backward. Keeps repeating this process, adding more rail cars each time. Chino is 15 feet above us, stoned out of his mind and giggling as he leaps from one moving car to another. He's a third world Peter Pan in knockoff Crocs, dancing for an audience of locals, migrants, and me. He's hamming it up and waving and grinning as he sprints across three moving cars in a matter of seconds. He runs and then he stops right at the edge of the lead car and then doubles back, mimicking the rhythm of this moving train. A couple of times, I think his forward momentum will be too much and will send him flying when he tries to put on the brakes. It's a dangerous, stupid, and entertainingly juvenile game that allows him to show off for the crowd and remind people that he's crazy as hell and not to be fucked with. I remember myself at his age doing equally dangerous and irresponsible things to entertain my friends. Dangling from a third-story roof drunk and high on Vicodin, putting a half stick of dynamite in my mouth and accidentally lighting the fuse while pretending it's a cigar, pushing a 500-pound dumpster down a steep hill and then me running in front of it to try to recreate a scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark. In college, I never drunkenly ran across the top of a moving freight train. It's probably because I didn't have access to a train. On the surface, my shenanigans were mischievous at best and irresponsibly dangerous at worst. I thought of my behavior as simply the kind of jackass things that young people did for kicks. Shit to make people laugh, which they often did. Deep down, though, I was trying to fill a hollowness that lived inside of me. A darkness that manifested itself in bouts of crippling depression, intense feelings of isolation and rage, and a playful death wish that loomed over my teenage years and early 20s. People have asked me how I can spend so much time with smugglers whose lives are dominated by risk and creeping demise. It's partly because it feels strangely familiar. I don't know what it's like to rob or kill someone, but I know what it's like to want to live fast and die. For many years, it felt like hints of death were the only things that could make me feel alive. This is probably one of the reasons I get along so well with Chino. We are long lost kin bonded by childhood trauma and long histories of dangerous self-medicating and self-harm. I see something of my adolescent self in his youthful recklessness, in his embrace of a life where death is something to be taunted and almost welcomed. The death wish that I had to overcome and my own lifelong struggles with complex PTSD seemed to give me some privileged insight into Chino's worldview, as well as that of many other men involved in smuggling that I will come to know quite well. As I watch him foolishly play on top of a moving freight train, I think about a cynical line from Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Addy, the matriarch of the Bundren family, says, the reason for living was to get ready to stay dead a long time. But what if the reason for dying is to know that you were once alive? It takes some coaxing, but Chino finally comes down from the top of this train. 
he and I shelter underneath a palapa and pretend that the heat is not smothering us. He grabs a stick and starts scratching out a map of train routes in the dirt. Names of towns are rattled off like a poem. Tapachula, Benimerito, Palenque, Corozal, Ixtepec, Tira Blanca, Tenosique, Lecheria, Salto de Agua, Coatzacoalcos. This uneducated young man has an advanced degree in Mexican geography. He knows places to avoid, places where a church might open its doors, places where teenagers with machetes with no, and no patience collect $100 head taxes. Survival here is a knowledge game with a steep learning curve. Chino speaks of a violent world of cycles with no viable end in sight. He says to me, man, I've spent a lot of time on the train, coming and going. Sometimes they grab you here and they send you back. So you try again and you go around that place. They grab you someplace else and you go around that place. And now you know not to go there either. You keep doing that and doing that. You come back and now you know where they caught you those times and you go around those places. It's simple, he says. Immigration gets tougher and we invent new routes. Well, how many times have you tried to cross Mexico, I ask? Maybe five times. I got as far as Laredo, Texas, he says. Well, did immigration catch you while you were crossing the border? No. I got across. It was incredible. I ended up living in a tree. I found some plywood and I climbed up into a tree with it. I had my little bed. And I tied it with some branches and ropes so that I wouldn't fall out. He says, I was up there in my little house with my cigarettes. I stayed up there at night. I spent like eight days sleeping in a fucking tree, he says, laughing. Immigration would show up looking for me, but they couldn't see me. Chino was up there smoking his cigarettes, and Chino loves to talk about himself in the third person. He says, they couldn't, it was easy. They couldn't, they couldn't see Chino. And then they caught Chino coming out of a 7-Eleven. They were watching me as I left the store, and they stopped and asked where I, was, where I was from. I told them I was headed home, but they knew I was undocumented because of how I talked. And Chino was always trying to convince me that he could pass for Mexican, and I would say, it's, it's a bit hard to believe, to believe that you're Mexican when your belt buckle has a Honduran flag on it, your wallet says Honduras, your arm has a big tattoo that says Catracho, which is slang for Honduran, um, and you've got a tattoo of a Honduran flag. Um, and also you have the most intense Honduran accent that I've perhaps ever heard. Um, but he said, no, 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 Jason, soy Mexicano, he can do it, and he's it's like just the, this running joke. Um, so I say, well, how long were you in the U.S. for, Chino? He says, like a month. But the problem is that you get there, and then what? Where are you going to go? You just end up on the streets. And this was the issue that so many of the smugglers that I work with had come across, is they were failed migrants. They were trying to get to the United States. And once they got here, they didn't really have a social network to kind of support them. And so they struggled to just make ends meet, and, and for various reasons ended up getting d deported or, or, or returned to, uh, to Mexico. And so I said, well, when was the first time you came? He says, I came when I was 16, and I've been coming ever since. And why did you leave in the first place? I couldn't go to school or stay with my family because of economic problems. There were so many of us in the house, and only my mom worked. I told my mom, Mama, you brought me into this world, so thank you, but I don't want to be another headache for you because you have enough of those. So I left. I had a friend who said, let's go to Mexico. It's pretty good over there. But in reality, he says, it's really hard here. There's immigration looking for you, and being undocumented means you can't get a job. You go and look for work here, but people don't want to give you a job because you're Honduran. I said, when was the last time you were there in Honduras? He says, I left seven months ago. I've been thinking about returning, but it's dangerous there because of the Matas and all that stuff. He continues sketching out a map in the dirt. It shows the border with Guatemala to the south, and Mexico City and Laredo to the north. His map covers thousands of square miles. Chino knows dozens of cities and towns and villages, but his view of them is tethered to the tracks. He never sees that all these places have to offer. It's like he's looking at the world through storefront windows. All right, maybe I'll do one more, is that okay? Okay, all right, last one. Um,
probably should have decided this earlier. <laughs> um, but it's like, it's kind of, okay, here's. So this is a moment with, uh, with a guy named Kingston who there were sort of two sort of types of smugglers who were, I guess, the, the things that were really categorizing the, the guys that I worked with were one, there were the young guys, so folks in their, their late teens, early 20s, who were sort of in the game, they'd been for a few years, and were, were, were trying to get out, um, and that's someone like, like Chino, someone like, like a guy named Santos, and then there were the kind of OGs, and by OGs, the, the veterans, the, the, old, the old men who were in their early 30s. And being, in, being a smuggler in your early 30s is, you know, means you've been pretty lucky or for various reasons. Um, and those guys were also trying to get out, but were really kind of embedded and really were, were, were struggling to get away from this lifestyle that they had been a part of for so many years. Um, and there were also sort of two groups of, of folks that I worked with. There were the Mestizo Hondurans, the you know, fair-skinned Hondurans, and then the, the Afro Hondurans, the Garifuna, um, the um, uh, folks who I worked with who were, you know, the, the, those two groups really highlighted the issues about race, especially crossing Mexico and um, the, um, the labor required to smuggle, you know, someone who, you know, if, if being black in Mexico was a very difficult um, thing. Um, and requiring a particular type of, of smuggler, um, usually another um, um, Afro-Honduran smuggler. And so Kingston was a character who, a person who I'd spent a lot of time with, um, had a really kind of uh, super difficult and tragic backstory, but an orphan at um, very young, um, in gangs very young, was in the Honduran military at like 11, was a sort of trained, um, Sharpshooter and all kinds of other stuff, but um, someone who was really struggling with, with, with violence and, um, um, and 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 trying to get out of the increasingly violent world of human smuggling. And so here we are. We're in a safe house in Veracruz, Mexico, hanging out on like a Saturday night. And he's talking about trying to get away. A dying electric fan pushes a mix of hot air and crack smoke around the tiny room. Kingston exhales and passes the pipe to Snoop. Go smoke that shit in the bathroom, he says. It's getting hard to breathe in here. Their buddy Chewy, who's sitting next to me, he squirts a rag with gasoline and places it over his nose and mouth. He takes two deep breaths and then tries to pass the rag to me. I politely decline. No thanks, I had a big lunch. He, he cackles and he points at Snoop walking away with the crack pipe. He says, that shit they smoke will kill you. We both laugh at the absurdity of his observation. In the background, Kendrick Lamar's voice tells us, bitch, don't kill my vibe. <laughs> Things have gotten more dangerous on the streets of Veracruz, so we've locked ourselves in Snoop's apartment to avoid the chaos outside. A new cartel has entered the city and is leaving a trail of blood as they battle it out with locals for control of certain neighborhoods and drug corners. There's talk of gunmen sweeping through town, taking out low-level hustlers so they can install their own people. Kingston is worried they are after him. He may have to leave town soon. It's unclear if this is just generalized paranoia that accompanies smuggling and prolific crack consumption or if he's actually in danger. Regardless, he has grown uh, more insistent that he needs to escape. And I say, was it too late for you to get out? I don't think so. But then at the same time, I think that maybe it's too late. I did some bad things in the past. And like they say, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I mean, I've been shot in the head, my foot, my neck. I've been attacked with machetes. But everything's OK, man. Life is life. I always say that there, there has to be good and bad things happening to you. If you don't have both, that shit is not real life. But what's it like to think that every day there might be someone that wants to kill you, I ask. He says, I worry about it a lot because I got my babies and my family. And then I say, but you seem lucky. You made it into your 30s. He says, I'm older than Jesus now. I'm glad for that, he says, laughing. I always thank God in the morning. I said, do you think you're gonna, that means you'll be okay? You never know. We could be drinking right now, and I go outside and someone comes up to me and goes, boom. He mimics shooting a gun. You'd be like, oh shit, that motherfucker was just here drinking with us. Life is like that. But I'm tranquilo now, he says. I'm just biding my time. 
But it's not easy, though, to be thinking that one day you could be dead. He says, some days I just, I, I can't sleep and I ask myself, what the fuck is wrong? I don't eat, I don't sleep. I keep thinking about all the bad shit I've done. There are days where I'd be eating and I see things and remember things and that shit kills my appetite. So what's next for you, I ask. He says, oh, maybe I'll just kick back, start a little business. I wanna try and live a calm life, a good life. I'm just trying to live through all this shit. I'm not saying that I'm gonna be a Christian or a pastor or none of that. And both of us laugh at that idea. But maybe God can find something else for me to do with my life. He clearly wants out of this smuggling and gang life, but his options are limited. He can't go back to Honduras because people want to kill him there. If he's caught crossing into the U.S., he'll face serious jail time. He doesn't have a Mexican work visa, so the only employment available to him is low-wage, low undocumented labor. He dreams of starting his own business, but clearly lacks the social skills to go legit. As night falls outside, and we talk about his plans to somehow get out. We get antsy from being locked in the house all day. You want to go to the club, he asks. The last time he and I went to a club, we came out and he almost beat a man to death. And I say to him, that sounds like a really bad idea. Sure, let's do it. What could possibly go wrong this time? He says, cool. I just have to stop at my house and feed my dog. We go to his house to feed his dog and we get there and someone has stolen every single thing out of his house, emptied his house of three rooms of furniture, money, guns, everything. He's screaming in the front yard. They even took my gun, he yells. And suddenly I feel quite unsafe, wondering who would have the audacity to steal from Kingston, who was a very scary individual. We decide that it's not a good idea to stick around. And we say, let's get out of here. So we hop in a cab and head to the center of town. And I'll never forget this. We, we headed to the center of town in Veracruz. He's just had his house robbed. He's freaking out and screaming at everybody. And we stop at a stoplight. And I look over, and there's all these people selling like jewelry and stuff. And someone goes, hey, Jason, how's it going? And I was like, and there were, it was these two archaeologists that I had worked with 15 <laughs> years previously on my dissertation who I hadn't seen in a long time. And they, were, they had some like side business. And I'm just in the car with this guy who was screaming about all of his stolen shit and his stolen money and his stolen gun. And I'm like, things are going okay. Um, <laughs> you know, um, this guy, this kid comes up and tries to wash the window and, and, and Kingston starts yelling at him and says, there's nothing here, Cardinal, nothing. Get the fuck out of here. Chinga su madre. People that I'm with are like, what the hell is going on with you? And so we slowly pull away and I kind of wave goodbye and say, I guess we'll see you later. And Kingston turns to me and for the first time since I've known him, this scary individual who's always trying to project this masculine, hyper-masculine confidence is on the verge of tears. Look at me, he says, I have no clothes. I'm in a fucking tank top and chanclas. The taxi drops us off in front of a rundown club. The thumping bass from the inside gives the impression that the sidewalk has a pulse. Let's get a beer and figure this, this shit out, I tell him. We get to the door and the bouncer gives Kingston the once over. Sorry, you can't come in here in sandals, he says. You have to have shoes on to get in here. And a man, I swear, like my face probably just went white thinking about what, what could possibly happen. And I brace for the worst. But Kingston just nods and says, no problem. As we turn and walk into the night, I'm thankful that our evening is coming to an early end. Thank you. This on? Yeah, it should be. Okay. So, Jason, I'm so glad you're here. As I was saying to to Yeva um, a few days ago or earlier, um, we've tried. I've tried and others to actually organize things for you here, and it was so difficult for you, partly because of the pandemic, but because of your in 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 such a high demand, and rightly so, because of 
the incredible work you've been doing. So um, I have enjoyed so much reading the book as much as I enjoyed the, the land of open graves. And I'm looking forward to, to, to trying it out with students uh, in the fall, as I have taught the land for open graves since 2016. Um, so there are so many things I would like to um, discuss with you, but as Eva instructed us, we can only have a couple of questions and then open it up to, to others. And there are going to be um, mostly thoughts and questions at the same time. So I was thinking that um, this book is very different compared to the previous mm. one, compared to The Land of Open Graves. And it's not just because it's a trade book compared to your academic book. It's also different in tone. Um, and one, uh, one thread that I actually saw coming through, uh, and I'm glad you read that a passage today that actually speaks to it, and that's a, a reflective tone that you have, that you put yourself in in a much more direct way compared to what you did with, um, with the land of open graves. And I found that incredibly interesting, um, uh, important for that kind of work. Um, so you have um, talked about your early life and how it relates to the, what you do at the moment and the attraction you feel for topics like that. But towards the end, in the epilogue of the book, you also talk about or express a sense of ambivalence about doing this kind of work, writing this kind of book. Um, there was a passage when you were talking about a sense of guilt. Mm. Um, there's a passage where you say, uh, what am I doing here? Is it that we're actually doing an autopsy on Genesis' life in the lights of a uh, um, uh, university auditorium? So this is something that uh, I think is incredibly generative for, for, for all of us who are involved in that kind of work. So I wanted to start by asking you to elaborate a little bit on that, especially that sense of ambivalence in doing an academic a scholarly project that becomes also a, a trade book, a public book, on the lives of those people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much um, for that question. I mean, it's 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 one that I've really struggled with. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, we were talking at at lunch about you know the talks that I've been giving about the book is that, you know, how do I sort of feel about it? And I think I was, you know, as I was saying to, to Peter, like, I'm, I'm on the fence. Like, you know, I think with, with Land of Open Graves, I was excited that I had, or relieved that I had finished a book, partly because I just didn't want to lose my job, right? You know, and so it was like, okay, I, I did what they asked me to do, but, yeah. but, but more importantly, I felt like I, I did a thing that felt like I needed to do for yeah. the families that I had been working with. Yeah. And with this book, you know, it really ends up being, you know, it was for, you know, my friend Roberto, I'm right, I, like I really, I wanted his story to kind of be told. Um, and that was this thing that was kind of driving me. But, you know, by the time I got to the end, there's no like triumphant moment. Yeah. There's no moment where I feel really good about it. Mm. Um, I was sort of was dreading like, you know, this is like a, for me, this is a big wound. Yeah. And, and it's, and then I, I was kind of talking to, to my wife about it and saying, you know, in many ways, I wish people could just read the book and get whatever they want from it. And I wouldn't have to go talk about it ever again, yeah. you know, and it's like, because it's, 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 it's hard to talk about it in these different kinds of ways. But obviously, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just a, a testimony to this friendship or, or, or a, a promise fulfilled that I would tell someone's story. You know, it's an academic book. It's a book that I got I got paid to do. Mm. It's a book that gets marketed. You know, it's all those kinds of things, and that makes me like really uncomfortable. And um, you know, and you kind of get to the point of like, okay, is my uncomfort am I uncomfortable enough to not do it? Mm -hmm. um, is that is it, or is it worth it to like? put this out into the world because I think it's, it, I hope it's going to do other stuff. And then there's uh, these other things I just have to kind of be with. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how it, why it ends like that where I'm, um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel good. I feel changed in a lot of, I mean, I feel, I, I, I will say the thing I do feel good about, which was the surprising thing was that having to write this book taught me a lot about empathy yeah. in a way that I was not expecting. Mm -hmm. And I think that these folks shared things with me that changed me in so many ways, 
forced me to take stock of who I am as a person, as a researcher, and I'm grateful. It was like this gift they gave me mm. that they didn't quite know that they were giving me. Um, but, you know, but then the, the weirdness of like, well, now I'm on a book tour, you know, and it's like, what does it mean to be on a, on a book tour about a story that, you know, my friend dies in it, and then mm. here I am, you mm. know, the person who, who, who gets to kind of talk about it. Mm. I, mean, I don't know. So, yeah. um, but I, I think all anthropology... Right. I mean, we're, we're representing other people's stories. Yeah. And um, um, not enough people, I think, for me, m maybe express that discomfort. I think a lot of us have it mm. and we don't say it. And, and mm. I'm just like, I got to the point, I got to the point with many things in my life where I'm like, I need to just say it out loud and that'll make me feel better because I don't want to keep it bottled up anymore. Yeah. 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 Th know? Thank you for that. Thank you. I will have the chance to elaborate, I guess, with your participation. But I want to get to the second question. And that's more to do with kind of some of the. Uh, more kind of, you know, central arguments in the discussion around migration. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to bring in a little bit my own experience in working uh, in the Mediterranean and several of the phenomena you're describing here and mm -hmm. in the previous book, of course, very familiar to us in the Med. In, in some ways, the nation states and the EU actually copy yep. policies that they were pioneered here. Uh, both the, you know, the, um, the, you know, all the policy you mentioned, and also the externalization of the border, mm -hmm. so prominent in the South Mediterranean, in different countries, in Turkey, in Spain, and elsewhere, and of course the phenomenon of the economy of the border you also discuss, and it, it, it appears to me that we are seeing here two versions of the border economy, you know, the sanctioned version mm -hmm. where there's so much money going to various NGOs and institutions, and the Unsuction or illicit or kind of form of the border economy that smugglers represent. And we can even talk about competition between the two. Mm. So I guess one way of looking at the persecution that so-called smugglers face here and in the Med is an expression of that competition. You know, you are going after your competitors in some way because you benefit from that border economy in ways that you don't want them to. But I want to focus on another related facet, and that's the ideological function of the notion of the smuggler. And I know you're also ambivalent about using the term, right? I mean, many our scholars talk about reclaiming it mm. from a discourse that attributes to the smuggler all that kind of, you know, everything that's wrong with the situation is smuggler's fault. But Smuggler as a figure and as a phenomenon as defined by the state and super state organizations allows the states to portray themselves as saviors, right? We save you from smugglers. The bad guys in the story of migration are not the border maker, are not the states, are not the EU, are the smugglers. And we'll come and catch them and we'll save you from that. And you know, the story is usual and we, we have seen so many cases where border crossers are persecuted as smugglers, yep. you know, because they happen to drive the boat or they happen to have the answer with the fewer money and they were, they, you know, in exchange of kind of the crossing, they, they drive the boat. So I want you, I would like you to ask and say a little bit about that kind of um, uh, process that's happening, you know, both the economic and the ideological function of the phenomenon of smuggling vis-a-vis -vis states. Uh, um, in this case, the states, but in, in Europe also, super mm. state organizations like the EU. You know, it's such a, an important question, and I think, in general, this is this term that we never interrogate, right? Yeah, and it's like yeah. we hear the word smuggler, and it just yeah. has it has its connotations, and we don't really we don't really discuss the complexity of it, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And you know. The border enforcement regimes, the, these industrial complexes, they need the smuggler to keep going, right? And in, in a lot of ways, I think that's part of why they, they um, you know, this is the whole border game of like, you, you need a bad guy, right? Yeah. To, to justify bloated um, yeah. budgets, yeah, yeah. you need to be able to say, th these are the bad folks, we need more money to kind of fight them. Yeah. You know, let's not deal with the, the things that are driving them. Let's not yeah. deal with, let's, let's not think about them as um, service providers or any yeah. of these other things. Let's think I about them in this very monolithic, you know, and um, I think inappropriate sort of way. Um, and so that helped, you know, and then for, for, for smugglers, you know, bo the border enforcement regimes, these, and these in industrial complexes, that just adds more, I mean, that just keeps them in business. Yeah. You know, when, when this work was happening in the beginning of the Trump era, the guy, like Kingston was like, I love Trump. 
Trump is great because he keeps telling all this crazy stuff that none of it's true. It's not going to change what's happening on the ground, yeah. but you know, and I can double my prices yeah. because people are worried about these things. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know, there, and I ended up having interesting conversations with Border Patrol who always wanted to know what smugglers were like and yeah. smugglers who wanted to know what Border Patrol were yeah. like. But these, you know, they, they, need, the they, they need each other. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, if we could decenter smuggling from the state, or not making that as a point of reference, then that forces us to think about this term in all, in all kinds mm -hmm. of new ways. Mm -hmm. And what happens if you think about a smuggler in this context as a service provider, yeah. right? As a, someone who is laboring as part of this, you know, capitalistic system that that's that's providing a service and that's that's responding to mark the market. Mm -hmm. um, then yeah. suddenly it's not, you know, it's like oh, this, it, it's about economics, but in a different in a mm. different kind of way. Or facilitator is the other yeah. term that yeah. people uh, have yeah. used. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. like and. Yeah. Um, and I do think that um, pushing, you know, the idea, changing the nomenclature, or at least giving us more ways to think about mm -hmm. what it is to be a smuggler, um, I hope then it's not just to like, I'm not trying to valorize what they do, um, although I think a lot of migrants mm -hmm. would, but I, I think it's to say, oh, let's demystify that. Yeah. And then, you know, because this book is, I mean, it's, you know, it's got smuggling in the title. That's like, you know, oh, salacious, and, and tell me all the kind of terrible stuff. But I'm like, you was know, it you or the publisher who insisted on using smuggling in the title? They wanted, I mean, because they wanted smuggling in the title way more than me. I was kind That's of it. on the fence, and, and yeah. you know, and but we had interesting conversations of like, you know, smuggling in the title gets people in the door. Yeah. There was a conversation about should we put Honduras in the title? I was like, that'll make people not read it. <laughs> because Americans don't care about Honduras. Yeah. They don't even know where it is. Yeah. Um, and so it's this kind of game. But I'm like, you know, smuggling is in the title, but it's about capitalism, yeah. climate change, race, yeah. all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think we can use the smuggler as a way, <clears throat> if, if we can flip the script a little bit, use it as a way to talk about these bigger issues and, sure. and to move beyond the, like, good guy, kind of yeah. bad guy thing. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Good to have you. Thanks. All right. Really fabulous uh, presentation. I'm, I'm, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm eager to get my signed copy, and then I will ask you more questions later by email. But I'm going to violate the rules in one way by asking a lot more questions than one or two, but I'm going to make them really short and to the oh, point, okay. and, I will I just, and I will just read them off, and you can choose okay. which ones to <laughs> jump on or not. So. One is just, you know, why write a popular trade book, right? Uh, how was the process different um, than your previous book? Was it harder? Was there this transition? I mean, a lot of academics aspire to do this, but few actually pull it off. And so I'm curious about that transition. Um, what's most surprised you about the research? What did you not expect at the start? And you kind of hinted, your answer was empathy. What you said here, so was, was, is that the answer or is there more? Than that, um, where does the title come from? Who are the soldiers and the kings? I have a suspicion who the soldiers are, but I don't see the kings, right? Um, so uh, uh, it'd be great if you could tell us that. We just discussed smuggling in the subtitle, but the title is Soldiers and Kings, so there's a mystery there. The other thing is these people have expertise in smuggling, moving, transporting human cargo in this case, uh, clandestinely, but their expertise is moving stuff. So why do they end up in one domain rather than another? The other one, obviously, is the drug trade. And how much do these things overlap? Because there's a conventional wisdom with they're intertwined, but actually, my understanding is that they're actually quite separate, and the drug trade mostly just taxes them for using terrain to, to move through, yeah. right? And that's what makes it so dangerous. So why one uh, or the other? Um, and then last but not least, and this is a methods question for anthropologists, but in general, academic. How do you access smuggling? How do you gain the trust of smugglers? I mean, um, this part of the reason this is an underdeveloped area of, of scholarly research is precisely because of the difficulty, sometimes danger, not just risk, but danger, mm -hmm. of actually trying to do it. So um, how does one actually pull it off, and how does one even I don't know, IRB, your you know, university system for, for approving you doing this kind of research. What, um, you know, what insights can you give us about actually, I mean, this, this is ethnography on steroids in a sense, right? So if you could say more about that. Mm, thank you. I'll, I'm going to go in reverse then. We'll start with that last question. You know, 
accessing smuggling was incredibly easy and was not something that I was trying to do. I was in Mexico, it was, I was, I'd finished the first book, I was getting ready to transition to something else, and um, I was kind of done with migration. And we did one, I did a, a last field school in, in Chiapas, I brought a bunch of students down, and I said, okay, students are here, they need to be in a safe place. I took them to a migrant shelter where they get locked in, and there's these nuns that just kind of control all of your movement, and it's like a no-fun zone kind of place. Um, and so I, I leave my students there, they're with my grad students, they're doing interviews with folks, and they're helping out in various ways. And I was, I was like, I've been in migrant shelters for like seven, eight years now, I don't want to do it anymore. And these, the nuns kept going, whatever you do, don't go outside, there's a lot of riffraff on the train tracks. And I was like, well, I'm so bored in here, I'm going to go outside and see what this is all about. And, and I went out there, was walking around the train tracks, and it was this simple. I see a bunch of, like, shirtless, like, rough-looking kids. There's a big cloud of marijuana smoke, all this, like, reggaeton playing. And I just kind of stumble over and go, hello, I'm an anthropologist, and what's going on over here, guys? And they were like, what? A, a who? And then I try to explain what I do, and, you know, like, are you a cop? I said, no, I'm not a cop. Um... You know, and they're like, you're like a journalist. And I was like, kind of, but I'm maybe more annoying. I'm going to be here longer. And, not, you know, and I said, I just, I had just written, I, said, I just wrote a book on migrants. And then someone just said, you know, why don't you listen to our stories? No one ever listens to what, like, what we have to say. And I was like, all I got is time. And they were like, have a seat. And it really was like that. Like within an hour, I'm recording interviews. And by the next day, it was more. By the end of the month, it was just like, okay, here's our chronicler. He's just here. And, um, and that opened up a lot of doors and just, you know, going back and wanting to be with these folks who nobody ever wanted to be around. They just found that to be so novel. Like, you're just, a, I mean, I'm like a weirdo, you know. And, that, and, and a lot of these guys, no one had ever, they'd never had a sympathetic ear. And so they just looked at me as like their chronicler, as their therapist for good or for, good or for bad. And so I was just there. And it, um, I was utterly shocked. I thought, I was like, this is supposed to be a lot harder. It got harder later in different ways. But um, just the, my presence there just seemed to just open up a lot of doors. Um, and the guys who were doing it, you know, they were experts in a lot of these things. And being very violent and, yeah, and selling drugs. Not so much moving them, um, but definitely... You know, there was drug stuff on the side. There was lots of there was extortion happening. There was kidnapping. There were some of the some of the folks who were, you know, their other job was being a, a you know assassin, and so they were kind of doing that stuff. And then they saw smuggling as a way where they could use their kind of skills, but perhaps for some kind of good. And then there were so I had lots of conversations with folks who would say, you know, this kind of balances out the other bad stuff that I'm doing there. And so there was all of these, these kind of moral, um, you know, uh, moments and ethical moments where they were, you know, where smuggling for them was, a, was like a, 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 perhaps a, a route, some kind of way for, for redemption. Um, and the title, so, you know, soldiers, there's all these foot soldiers, Chino, Santos, the, and, and, and the upper, like, Kingston would refer to the men underneath him as his soldiers you know, my soldados. And so it's part of it was, you know, these low-level folks who were doing all the kind of grunt work. The king's part comes from um, a lot of the, these Honduran guys, you know, they'll refer to each other as king, like mi rey. And so it was this kind of term of endearment, um, you know, that you are, my, you are my, my king kind of thing. But also there's, there was this constant need for, especially for a guy like Kingston, to present themselves as the most powerful, macho, dominant male in the room the alpha male the king of the the king of this like empire and yet incredibly fragile like it was all you know smoke and mirrors that that, that within within a flash everything could completely fall apart and so i wanted to like like you know in this in this case like you know who is the king in this whole moment right and 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 how precarious is that is that that position um the thing that surprised me, other you know, the empathy thing was a big one. Another thing that surprised me was just the amount of boredom. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, you got to really like. I mean, it, it's a good thing that I like hanging out, drinking beer, and doing nothing, because <laughs> that was like what we spent so much time doing, yeah. especially in the in this in this era of Plan Frontera Sur starting to happen. A trip that used to take three weeks was now taking almost three could take three months, and so I'd be with these guys for five days in Pacalna waiting for the train to come. And so we're just like sitting around and sitting around. I remember I, I was telling Yeva that when we were working on this documentary film, Border South, the, the filmmaker came down 
And the first day we go out there, he's got his camera on. We're sitting on the train tracks. And by like hour seven or eight, you know, we've just been listening to music all day, drinking beer, watching these guys, you know, snort and do whatever other things we're doing on the tracks. He goes, so when are you going to start working? I go, I am working. This is work. You know, like it's like you got to be in the moment. And a lot of times the moment is just surprisingly boring, um, which is, I think, also why these guys like me being around because that's free entertainment. Like I got nothing, um, you know, they're already, they have to be there. And so they had someone who could, who could, you know, entertain them in various ways. But yeah, the amount of boredom. And then when you start to do the calculations, um, you know, you're making under minimum wage for this whole thing because you're spending so much time. And it's like these bursts of money that make up for three weeks of not eating anything, but then it, you know, it, it goes so, so quick. Um, and so this idea of, you know, these soldiers were making like nothing compared to, you know, the, the higher ups who were actually, you know, brokering the deals. Um, and then the last thing about the, you know, the trade book, why a trade book, I think first was, I just felt like these were stories that, that I wanted to tell for a, a larger audience. And I didn't want to um, bury the lead by trying to over theorize about it, you know, mm -hmm. that I just thought that like, and, and in the beginning, there was this, this notion that it was going to be this, this photo ethnography where a big chunk of it was me theorizing about photographic practice and camera technology. And my agent was like, no. And then my editor was like, hell, definitely no. Like nobody, like a general audience does not want to hear your take on like shutter speed and ISO. Um, in relationship to these things. This and, is what yeah. you told me in 2016. Yeah, yeah, man. yeah. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, and then, so that's the that's the companion book to this where it'll allow me to kind of do some of those things that I want to do. Um, but, you know, the, the story ended up for me being so compelling that I wanted to just not put other things in there that were going to be distracting. Um, was it, it was a different writing process in that I was kind of liberated. You know, I felt like, the, you know, with the first book, there was so much pressure to like to do a bunch of different things to make people happy to think about tenure review, um, and the you know when I when I got to UCLA, um, they didn't care what I wrote next or if I didn't you know because I, I made this I made the jump you know as part of my deal was I went from associate to full without writing a second book, and and that was like super liberating when I go oh wait I don't have to write a second academic book if I don't want to I can do whatever I want so let's just let's try this and. Um, which was, yeah, like I said, liberating, but also like really terrifying to sit down and be like, do I have any business trying to write a trade book? Like, um, and, um, but I loved the process. I felt like I really got into it and, and enjoyed being with it every day and, um, and feeling like my commitment for, with a trade book was really trying to be kind to my reader and trying to tell the most compelling story I possibly could. Um, without having to worry about is it going to be does it have to be something else as well like it was just this thing and um, and I like that um, but yeah really a, a lot of pressure and and a, and a terrifying you know working with a trade press it's just a different beast and you feel like mm. like am I supposed to really be here this like you know this is not so it's, not, it's a it's was uncharted territory for me. You made lots of compromises in that process. But I didn't make I don't feel like I made any compromises mm. and I think that. My ed my editor really understood the project in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. That's why I sort of went with with her because I, I felt like I trusted her immediately. Yeah. And so um, she just just like do what you want to do. Yeah, and and I was the one who was coming back and saying like I don't can I do this you know and she's like you can do this it's okay you yeah. know. Um, but she had a pretty a pretty light light touch, um, but made I think very smart when, when she needed to be present mm -hmm. she was really there and, and super That's helpful. Great. So for the sake of time and to open the floor for audience questions, I do have two questions, but I will only ask you one, either the policy or the ethnography one. Um, I'll go with the ethnography one. So you write uh, towards the end of the book, um, you say ethnography comes with a price. It comes with a hangover that lasts forever. And... Uh, as a fellow ethnographer, I think I, I understand what you, what you mean by that. I understand this disorienting and painful, like a whiplash kind of experience when you move from the field to academic space and then the people you were working with, they kind of 
remain stuck there. And this whiplash is stronger when you form really strong relationships with people. And forming strong relationships with people uh, means you build trust. So, um, and to build trust, you, you're taking risks, but also the people you're working with take risks mm -hmm. to kind of talk to you. So I was wondering, could you say a little more about how you navigated these relationships with people and how maybe you um, kind of um, set an ethnographic limit behind which you wouldn't go or your both maybe personal and ethical boundaries that you set out to do this research? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you know, ethnography is, I mean, it's personal. I don't think it can't be, you know, I've, I've had people ask me things like, like, are you, is it okay to be friends with people that you work with? Or like, you know, people, some people don't like those terms. And I was like, I don't know any other way to be, you know? And I mean, it's a job, it's my work, but it's so much more than that, right? And like, you're connected to it in ways that, you know, this is why my kind of ambivalence of like, this is a, this is a scholarly pursuit. Mm -hmm. This is an intellectual exercise, but it's also a deeply personal intellectual, you know, it's got all these kind of things in it. And so I, it's hard to like, to disentangle those. Things. I think it, for me, I think it's impossible to disentangle. Um, and I think it is for most people, except the difference being a lot of times as academics, we're, we're encouraged not to talk about those things. Like the, the questions that you've just asked me, like what are your limits? What's too much, Baba, you know, the, the whiplash, all these things. We're not supposed to talk about those things. We're supposed to hide those things, and um, I'm just not like I was telling your class today. Like I'm an oversharer, uh, you know, and it's like I got to get it out. I have to like let these things out because um, to keep them in, it's just it, it doesn't it doesn't feel it doesn't feel good. Um, but you know the the work, it's for me. I think the part of ethnography why it's so challenging, um, but also so rewarding for me is that like. These folks give you so much, right? They tell you about their lives, and and then and then trust you to go and, and, and do something, you know, that you've promised you're going to do with it. But at the same time, I think um, they often expect that you give a lot of yourself to them too. And you know, you're giving so much to the work, and you're giving so much to people that it's really taxing. And um, it's a thing that it doesn't ever turn off. You know, especially now with like social media and smartphones. I mean, you're just people are texting all the time. You're in the field all the time. It's really hard to kind of decide then when is when is work over, when is it done? And you know, for some time, for some of the stuff, it's it's a lifelong commitment. You know, the folks I read about in my first book, I'm in touch with them all the time. And um, you know, the the, per, the person that um, that I call Memo, who's in my first book, you know, I'm like his health insurance for the rest of his life. You know, and and that was a, a commitment that I never said. You know, like if you do this thing for me, I will always you know take care of you. Um, but when he became sick and there was no one else, you know, I knew that that was where I where I had to be, um, and that was just part of this you know this process of getting close to someone. But I you know, but at the same time, I get so much out of that those personal kind of experiences. Um, but it is really it's hard to know when to walk away. Um, you know, as we were, we were talking about, there's some folks that, you know, like in your new book, um, which comes out next week, you should all get Yeva's new book that comes out on Tuesday. It's very exciting. Um, you know, but there's people that you write about, people that I write about that um, they're difficult relationships. And um, it's painful sometimes too when you have to like cut someone off, walk away, figure out, you know, that this is no longer a healthy kind of thing. Um, and this book tested me in a lot of ways, you know, about like my own limits. And, and I tried to, you know, um, I'm, I'm a, like, I'm a character in this book. You know, I play myself in this book. And, and part of that is because I wanted the reader to know who I was and how my relationships sort of had unfolded with these folks. Um, but also more importantly, I wanted you to know what the struggles were because I think it's important for people to understand what ethnography actually is and why our struggles as ethnographers are often different than like a journalist, right? Who doesn't necessarily have a 10 year commitment to a, to a, a topic or to a group of people where we do. And that just comes with with way different kinds of, of issues to, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to deal with and, and work through. Um, but yeah, it's an ongoing process that I wish 
I wish it would not be ongoing, but um, <laughs> you know that's part of the part of the, the job. Well, I'm I'm so glad you're here and we can talk about these things <laughs> in in academic spaces. So we do have about. 20 minutes um, for questions, and also we might have more time for your questions, Janis, <laughs> since you have more of them. Uh, but let, let, let's see what uh, people want to ask. I think you need to use the microphones, because this is also going online somewhere. <laughs> Hi, Jason. Thank you so much. It is always very refreshing to listen to you. Um, I will. I will have a lot of questions, but I'll ask just this one. Um, I didn't get the chance to read your book yet, but I read like some parts of Sharam Koshravi's like seeing like a smuggler mm -hmm. that came out like a couple years mm -hmm. ago. So when you actually mentioned that, um, you know, the morals, ethics, like or like the smuggling work as redemption, it kind of resonated with me in the sense that Sharam Koshravi was talking about, you know, smuggling as a kind of almost like anti-imperial or like, you know, a political work versus, you know, people who are just doing it for the money. So that tension between like ethics, uh, politics and um, yeah, finances, money. I guess if you can talk a little bit about that, I'd be very happy. And the second question is what happened to the dog? Oh, <laughs> Tyson, that's the dog, the dog's, the dog's name. Um, he got Tyson back. Oh, okay. Good. It, 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 it took a lot, but um, yeah, the dog, the dog was returned, thankfully. Um, I don't know if Kingston is the best dog owner, but he at least <laughs> got his dog back. Um, you know, the, the political work of smuggling, I do think that when you, when you frame it as like a form of resistance or as labor or as, um, you know, this kind of life-saving you know, tether that, that, that people are, are, are reaching for, it, it really changes those, the, the way that we, we conceptualize it in, in all kinds of ways. And I was talking to someone recently, and, you know, and they wanted to make the, the comparison with, like, the Underground Railroad and mm -hmm. saying, you know, a lot of people don't like that comparison. He's like, but there are people who were on the Underground Railroad who collected fees as part of that process, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, need your, I need some monetary support. I'm doing the Lord's work, but it'd be much better if the Lord had some, <laughs> had some cash for me to kind of do this thing too. And... Um, and so I, I think that, but to do that with smuggling, I, people get really un, un, uncomfortable yeah. with it. Um, the guys that I worked with, when they needed to really justify it, then it was this like, I'm providing a really good service. You know, I, you know, um, just because, you know, I'm, I'm hyper violent, but me being hyper violent in this context and being well armed is part of me providing the services that you require. And so I got to do what I got to do if you need to get you, like I promised to get you where I'm going to, where you're going to go. Um, a lot of times those guys would, um, would lean on that. Um, sometimes they believed it, I think. Other times it was an easier way to, um, to like avoid talking about money or about how much they were robbing people on the side and all this other, other kind of stuff. And there's a moment in the book with this guy Flacco, who I really, um, really got along well with and who's not like a, he doesn't seem, I've seen him the only one who really likes Flacco. Um, I mean, he's sort of like, people are like, they're kind of ambivalent about him. Um, but there's a moment in this, in the book where he's helping these people um, get across Mexico and up to the U.S.-Mexico border. And then one of his buddies who wants to get across, who's also a smuggler, he says, you know, Flacco's going to get me to California. It's going to be great. And Flacco looks at him and he says, don't put all your trust in me. You should put your trust into God. I'm only a man. Like, <laughs> You know, I'm going to help you, but you know, I'm like, you got to keep that in mind, kind of thing. And in the same conversation, I had been asking him. I said, "Well, isn't it sometimes you have to like rob people, right?" He goes, "Oh, I would never rob any. That's what bad people do. You know, I, like if you rob someone, God's not going to protect you, kind of thing." And we have this long conversation about religion and about how he's a he's a he's one of the good ones. And then I start asking about this this kid Jorge. I'm like, "Where did Jorge go?" You know, and who he had been smuggling for like six weeks. He goes, oh, I already got him across the border. He's great. He's already got a job. Things are wonderful, you know, and then story ends. And then two days later, Jorge calls me and goes, have you seen Flacco? He stole $6,000 from me and left me abandoned on the streets <laughs> of Mexico, right? And so um, it was always interesting when those, when those things kind of came up. And, um, and then there are other folks in the book who would talk about 
providing smuggling as a service. And I do think truly be- like mm-hmm. that was their goal. And there's a guy that I call Santos. I call him Santos because he's for me the most saintly one in the whole mm-hmm. in the whole story, and he's the one that I'm like rooting for the most. And and he if if he had said that to me, I would believe him 100. Um, percent But everybody's kind of justifying the work in, in different kinds of ways, and um, and depending on when you ask him, you know that would that would kind of color how they were thinking about the, the work in that in that moment. But in general, I, I, I think we should just we should be thinking about this in these more kind of complex ways and getting us beyond this this more simplified um, kind of narrative. Okay, is this fine if I just touch? Yeah. <laughs> um, you were talking. You, you were saying that they kind of saw you at first as like their chronicler, um, and later we're talking about your ongoing relationship and like your dedication to them. So I was wondering if you've had a chance to share any of like, in any form, the kind of like the results, if you will, of the ethnography and how that how that process has been, if 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 it at all Some, happened. Selling books. Yeah, yeah. That, <clears throat> you know, I had once where I was giving a. Triple A presentation, and we FaceTime with Flacco, and I was like in front of this room of like 200 people, and I was like, "Hey, check it out!" You know, and he just thinks it's this crazy thing of like, "Why would people care about what I have to what I have to say?" Um, but then he got to the point where he's like, "So I'm going to be on the cover of this book, right? My face, all this kind of stuff," and I'd be like, "No," um, you know, they, they all know about it like in, in different ways. Um, uh, some of them are waiting for the Spanish version. I think they will be interested in reading it. Someone like Flacco. He's like he, he has he, he's not a big reader, um, um, but he he would be someone great to have on a panel, Mike. I mean, um, but you know it's um you know what I ended up sharing with those guys the most and the thing that they always were the most interested in was the photography, was they always wanted to see the photos and so I was constantly coming back and bringing bringing images, um, and and that was kind of true you know and they're not I mean the, the pictures in this book. There, you know, there's not very many of them, and most of them don't have don't have faces on them um, by design. I think with the next with the companion book, maybe you'll see some faces, but they're totally disconnected from any text, so you don't really. But I worry about facial recognition technology and all that kind of stuff. And some of the, you know, and some of the guys in the book, I was like, look, you need to make your Facebook profile private. Yeah. Well, why? I'm like, well, because you're holding a machine gun, a pile of money, and then it says under occupation smuggler. Like, you know, I like, you know, so there, we, we had long conversations about what these guys should and shouldn't be doing. Um, but, you know, mm. they weren't so much interested in the, in, the, in, the, in the text, although someone like Kingston was like, I want you to get, all, get this whole story, right? Mm. There's a lot of stuff. You, I want you to put all this stuff in there. And so he was very concerned about, about the, the whole backstory. Um, but definitely way more interested in the in the photography and even with the first book you know a lot of those guys i wrote about are, are not you know really literate um but like someone like my, my like my friend memo for him anytime someone comes to his house he pulls that book out and is like look this is me this is about me you know he's never read it but he knows that he's in it he can see he can he can see himself and and that has always been this really important thing for him which is difficult for us as anthropologists because right the IRB does not want us taking pictures does not want us showing faces um, to protect people's you know identity for various reasons but it's really to protect you know these these corporations that we all work for um, that um, you know that are that are being cautious but you know these folks are like they want to be seen and with a lot of these guys in these books they know that they're not going to see 40 and so they don't really care about you know anonymity i mean they want to they want to some record that they were that they were there and that they were important for a moment um which really creates a lot of tension between the requirements of the institution that we work for and the and you know our ethical commitments to to the folks that we also are working for in some ways stay on so thank you so much. I, I have also haven't read the book yet, but I very much want to after hearing your presentation. Um, so my question follows up on some of these themes. I guess I'll link two parts. One, one is about the empathy and 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 the the effort in the book to kind of humanize and and complicate smuggling and maybe not rehabilitate it, but at least make us think about it differently. But I was wondering, like hearing you speak and hearing the and thinking about the tone of the book that I'm gleaning from the things that you read, like. Were there people who, who, when you kind of assess them, even with, with an empathetic kind of point of view, in the end you think, this is a bad 
actor. This is a this is a bad character, right? They're violent. Maybe they've raped. They've stolen. They've killed. I mean, how do you how do you how did you navigate the 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 reality that 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 a, that a truly candid depiction of human reality includes that bad side too? And what did you feel any pressure in writing a book that's meant to to kind of um, get us to think more? complexly about smuggling did you feel any pressure not to include the worst of the worst mm -hmm. and and that's relates to the second part of the question which is the audience for the book so i mean what i think for, as anthropologists we often seem to write for the pre for to, to the converted right we preach to the converted so do you have any hope that this book will be read by people who are most opposed to your po politics on migration or is it more likely to be read by people who sympathize with what you do, what you believe. I hope that people will read it. I mean, at the end of the day, all, all we could do is put something out there and people can do whatever they want with it. And I think part of it, you know, this, this, this question about audiences, that I hope that some people will just pick it up because they want to hear a good story about a thing. And that thing just happens to be smuggling. And maybe, maybe they'll come out of it thinking about it in a different kind of way, but it's more... Um, you know, is it a story about smuggling or is it a story about six people whose lives are caught up in these things, one of them being smuggling, um, and let's get to know them kind of along the way. That's for me is, is probably a more realistic goal is just like, uh, these people were so important to me. Um, you know, my friend Roberto, who, uh, who is, was, is, is killed during the course of field work. This is for me was a way to keep him alive, um, was the writing process. And like the book ends with him like running around and acting like a maniac and telling funny jokes and even and but even though he's dead I felt like I got to bring him back for one more moment and he gets to stay he gets to kind of stay alive forever um I want people that maybe that's the most I can hope for is that people will get to know these folks and um and and maybe think a little bit differently when they hear the term smuggler that's it yeah. um anything beyond that you know is is great but um you know I'm hoping that that, that, that they can at least take that from it um in terms of the you know the bad stuff, it's funny. The review that was in the New York Times uh, two weeks ago picked up on this line in the beginning, where I say there were some smugglers that I avoided because they gave off a bad vibe, and then the re the reviewer says something like, "Well, what about those folks who give who, like what about the really like bad people that you didn't hang out with?" And I'm like, "Okay, well, I hung out with a lot of murderers in this book who were like like there were other people who weren't." talking about murder or who were who were just too scary but there are definitely folks in this book who you know there's a, a this this person that I call Payaso Payaso was one of the scariest most dead-eyed like cold-blooded killer who I just spent a lot of time with and he's in there and we you know he's it, he's a knitter and so there's a whole thing in the book about how I get freaked out by guys who knit now because the other guy who's who's knitting who who I'm spending time with ends up murdering you know my friend and so th there is a lot so that's all, that's there and I try to keep that as upfront and let people know that it's just it's lurking under the surface um or sometimes it's just out in the open um and so it was funny I wanted to write back to this this book review and be like I don't know how much worse it you know, like, you don't think Payaso is, like, the bad guy? Like, he's, he's scary, you know? But also, you know, he's the same person who's texting me from, from prison and being like, hey, I made you this SpongeBob SquarePants handbag, you know, and these photos of this thing. And I'm like, this is, like, uh, this is a difficult, this is, a, yeah. I'm feeling weird. Um, you know, there's a guy that I call Preacher, also just, like, cold-blooded killer. He's talking about murder. Um, and so those guys are kind of there. I didn't spend... A lot of time with them, um, for obvious for, for various reasons. But I, I spent you know enough time I think where they they show up. Um, but I wanted I wanted people so I wanted them to like people know that they're there that they're in the room oftentimes. But but they weren't necessarily the ones who were the most committed to smuggling. I mean they were there because they they were there as like as, as enforcers. But someone like Kingston was was there more like he would rely on these guys to do some of the dirty work but but he was someone who was more committed to like the labor itself um and so i, I try to give people a, you know know that it's a diverse group of people who are involved in this and some of them you know they run the the spectrum of you know what you sort of good to bad if you want to frame it that way um but i definitely tried to keep as much of that in there as um as as, as possible um and yeah and it scared the it scared the hell out of me you know 
So we have time for one more question. I remember, I know there was a hand there yeah. and a hand there. Okay. Um, Oh. <laughs> well, maybe you can both formulate your questions and then Jason will answer them together. Hi, Professor. Thank you so much for sharing your work today. And um, I, I guess my question is a comment and then followed by a question. But I, in, at some point in your presentation today you, and in the conversations that we had recently, too, it was that question of who's the audience and, and what purpose does the book serve? Uh, you know, I know that you mentioned the, that guilt of you know, benefiting your career further based on this book that you know, is um, depicting so much violence and, and trauma for people. Um, but I, I do think that there is a really important thing that's happening with the book. And, and I think um, Dan, Dan Smith uh, mentioned it too about the humanity. Um, I, you know, I, my family is also from El Salvador and I look at like what happens with incarceration rates in El Salvador right now and Bukele's government where everyone is just, you present a certain way, you have a tattoo, you're looking a certain way, immediately go to jail and hopefully you'll be seeing a court date at some point in your life. Um, but what happens within the Salvadorian community is like this notion that, oh, they're all bad. And then there isn't much exploration as to what happened. How did a 14-year-old boy suddenly be, get caught up in all this? So I think that within like the Latino community at large, but then specifically communities that are directly impacted by this and that are then led to just believe this very black and white narrative of bad people and good people, I think it's important because I feel like you're illustrating a lot of really important things about the humanity of the people, but also, you know, the masculinity that has to be performed um, and machismo in Latino America and then the PTSD that's caught up mm -hmm. in that masculinity. So people performing it, being hurt by it and then the cycle just constantly repeating and then I, I'm, I don't know if in the book, I haven't read the book yet, but how it also impacts women alongside and other you know trans folks and other people. Um, but yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to know, like I wanted to just say I do think um, it's an important thing to do to show the complexity of the situation. Um, in terms of my question, <laughs> uh, I guess I wanted to ask, knowing how maybe social connections work, if I, I, you mentioned that the nuns kind of warned you, don't go there, don't talk to these people. But then once you decided to pursue this project, did you find that people were still like more vocally discouraging you to not pursue it? Um, and then did you ever find that there was a moment where people didn't want to get close to you because they knew that you were close to people that they viewed as just bad? Um, I, and then granted, I know that you, it's, you're established and you can do this project and you have your own reputation, but I just wonder if like people, you faced a bit of alienation because you were working closely and seeing people um, who other people don't want to see or who don't care to know. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to add your question to? Sure, I'll just, um, I mean, you, you've said a few things about empathy already that I, I really appreciate, so I'll just add one thread to what you brought up just now, which is um, I worry, I bring this up also because I'm very invested in, in your responsibility of writing about this. So I'm interested in the shift from what you experienced to then how you go out and write it for a broader public. Um, and I wondered if you could say more about that as since you talked about empathy first as a very personal experience if that feels like when you're writing it for a broader public that is a kind of translation of the empathy you you felt or if it's a different exercise thinking about the kinds of stories that are needed right now and i say it because i worry uh, about the failures of empathy so i think i work in the mediterranean and think about things like um the actually the huge and then very short-lived response to something like the circulation of the photo of Alan Kurdi on the beach. So we're talking just wondering about, how yeah, you negotiate that kind of thing. We were all talking about storytelling. Yeah, we were talking about that photo this this afternoon and just mm -hmm. yeah. It's sh short shelf life and then mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um so let me see here. Um the you know, if you there's, we did this documentary in 2019 called Border South, that um, the movie ends 
with me in a migrant shelter talking to all of these Central American migrants about how dangerous the U.S.-Mexico border is and how all these people die crossing the desert. Um, I didn't want to give that talk to this group of people who were, you know, who were in southern, in southern Chiapas and they were eventually going to get up there. Um, but the, um, one of my grad students said to me, the nuns are so sketched out by you because you're just outside all the time with these bad people that, that they're wondering what you're doing. They're, they're wondering why you're in charge. All this, like, so can you come in and do something like to kind of show them that you're not just like some like extortionist, scumbag, whatever. And so that's why in the, there's that scene in, this, in that film where, I have, where I've given this talk that I never would have given had I not been pressured to like show that like, oh, actually I'm, I'm okay, I guess, you know, I've got good intentions. Um, you know, there, there were, um, yeah, there were a lot of moments where people were like, what's up with your friends, you know? Um, like what, like, you know, how do you hang out with these guys all the time? And, you know, and me trying to explain, you know, what I was doing and, you know, I think and part of the book and the, the, one of the things that I have to come to grips with too is like, what does it say about me that I get along so well with these folks, right? And, um, and so I try to write about, you know, my own position and, and why that is. And, and, you know, it's, it was this, um, you know, this idea of like, is it like the, the porno is it the, the pornography of violence? I'm trying to fill the like suffering slot, right? Are the, like those are like questions and critiques that have been put forth. And for me, it ended up being like, I have a, um, an understand, a particular understanding, I think, of violence that's, and it's familiar in various ways. And that's, and, and what's happening with these guys, there's this gravitational pull that we're, you know, we're sort of, we, we see each other in a, in a way that maybe others won't, which is not something that I would ever want to like, you know, wanted to put on a T-shirt or like, hey, I'm fucked up, and so that's why I study fucked up stuff. And then now this is the book where it starts out where like, hey, I'm fucked up, and this is, you know. Um, but that was an understanding that I came to as I was like asking myself, why am I here? You know, how am I being judged? And and, and I need to explain myself. Um, uh, but yeah, that that would that would kind of come come in in and out in 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 different in different moments, and so I just had to put everything on the on the table, um, both for myself and I think for 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 um, for readers, um, you know. And in, and in terms of the of of the of the empathy stuff, um, yeah, I mean, you always worry that you do this thing and it it flashes and then it goes away and then you know and now we move on like Black Lives Mattered for three weeks and then you know. Um, uh, Central American kids that were really important for like a month and and, and now it's it's gone away and that's a struggle and I think for me the storytelling I hope it, you know about these folks that that can last longer than you know it's not a story about migration or a story about smuggler for me it's a story about these these individuals who happen to be doing those things but if I can really focus on those stories I hope that that will that it'll impact people in a way that it impacted me and st stick with them longer. And so that when you hear the word smuggler, if you read the book, then you, can, you go, oh, is that Kingston? Is that Chino? Is that, you know, is that Alma who, who, or whoever it is? That maybe for me is, is part of the goal. It's not so much to like, uh, um, I'm not trying to begin with like, let's empathize with smugglers or, you know, it's more like, let me give you these stories and see, and see if that works. See if you can kind of, if you can, you can that'll stick with you. Um, and my favorite ethnographies are the ones where I remember the people's names, right? That's like that's like I go, oh, that person. That's who I have in my in my in my my brain, and um, um, th that's what I I, I kind of hope. And you know, I spend a lot of time in this book on the backstories and really building into that so that people kind of understand what's what's happening. I mean, there's a moment, this moment where Kingston almost kills this man in front of this bar. Um, the backstory that I try to tell about that is. He's, this happens in the moment where he's trying to protect me, and th and this reaction, this hyper violent reaction, is not just because he is this like violent person, but in some ways it was his act of protection and care for me. And th there had been a moment in his childhood where someone that he cared about had been attacked, was been murdered, and the question had been put to him, "What are you going to do about it?" And he didn't do anything in that moment, and forever regretted that, and had then created this like hyper violent response that was really a part that his way of like showing care. And that's like, for me, it was just this difficult thing to kind of write about and to r grapple with. And But I wanted to give, I try to give the reader this backstory so that now when they think about that story again, they're like, oh, like this person who grows up in this hyper-violent world, like this is their version 
mm. of empathy. This is their version of care, mm. right? And yeah. um, which is not, which I think you, we often don't get. Okay. We don't get that, right? Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, only, no, 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 just a tiny comment. Okay. Okay. Just to finish. Um, in relation to this discussion about empathy, which is one of the key threads, Jason, I think uh, you end up with uh, an epilogue that is more about politics and less about em empathy. And for me, that was a very, very strong message because you talk clearly about the beneficiaries. Mm. So you're saying to all your readers, hey, you, you people, are, you're benefit yep. from this, right? Yep. And I think that's uh, we perhaps a, a, you know, another way of relating to empathy, but at the same time not forgetting that it's also about who benefits from yeah. this kind of border no. regime. No. Yeah. I mean, everyone in this room, we benefit from the labor of smugglers, Yeah. right? Yeah. And we just, I mean, we don't think about that, but that's, yeah. you know, that's how, that's how it works. Whether that's the, you know, the drugs people are snorting in the bathroom or, you know, the labor that's that's been moved here, people yes. who have been brought here to now and, and provide, you know, crucial labor for various economies. I mean, this is all in the backs of, yeah. of smugglers. Um, and that's an awkward conversation. Know. You know, it's <laughs> like, the, yeah, but right? I mean, it's obviously true. Yeah, you know. thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jason, and thank you to the panelists and the audience. Um, so the, there are books outside. Jason can sign them. There is also a reception. We can continue this conversation in a more informal manner. Thank you. Thank you.